On 5 News, the warning that overcooking starchy foods can give you cancer. Avoid toast and roasties and chips are out too, say government scientists. But now they're getting a grilling from the public. I think I'm bombarded with too much information like this. I like it this, I like it in this breakfast, so I, I never worry for this. Will it change anything? No. I keep eating. <laughs> Also, the Prime Minister comes clean on what she knew about the nuclear missile test that went wrong. She admits she was told about the mistake before a crucial Commons vote. First day in the office for President Trump, and the fighting has already started. And Milton Keynes turns middle-aged. The new town of the 60s is 50 today. Hello and welcome to 5 News. I'm Sean Williams. It was a serious warning from the government's own scientists about everyday foods. Too much burnt toast or overcooked chips and potatoes could increase your risk of cancer. But the Food Standards Agency, who issued that warning, has been criticised by a number of other scientists who say the evidence is weak and the risk unproven and negligible. One even said if you ate more than 300 pieces of burnt toast a day, it's still unlikely you'd be affected. Our health correspondent Catherine Jones investigates. Starchy foods like bread and potatoes are an important part of our diet. But if you cook them by frying, toasting or roasting, there is now a health warning attached. The process that gives your toasted bread or your roasted potatoes its brown colour and its flavour also creates a chemical called acrylamide, which is known to cause cancer. And the browner your food, the more acrylamide there is. The Food Standards Agency has begun a campaign to drive that message home, encouraging us not to overcook starchy foods. Go for gold. Cook food till it's a golden yellow colour. No but the advice is based on experiments process. on mice, and some experts say the link to cancer in people just isn't strong enough to warrant this much attention. Acrylamide has been known about for years, and people have been trying for years to measure its association, and they haven't found that. So I think the one thing we can say, that even if there is some increased risk, is not important. Some diners we spoke to do feel overloaded with different health messages. They do say that there's quite a lot of stuff with cancer in quite a lot of things. Do you think they have a responsibility to tell us if they know there's... If they know there's something definite. I think I'm bombarded with too much information like this. Well, I know it's not very pretty, this, because so much oil, everything, you know, but I like it, this. Will it change anything? No. I keep eating. <laughs> <laughs> but the Food Standards Agency insists it has a duty to be transparent about any possible risks and how to minimise them. Do you feel you might be diluting the healthy eating message? No, because the messages are quite similar actually. What we say is that it's important to have a varied and balanced diet. Don't panic if you have one slice of burnt toast or one overcooked potato it will be fine. But during your lifetime of eating these foods try to minimise the amount that you overcook. Too little advice and officials risk failing to protect us, too much and the public may simply switch off. The evidence and its limitations have now been explained. It's up to each of us to decide what to make of it. Catherine Jones, 5 News. The Prime Minister has admitted she was told about a test involving Britain's Trident nuclear deterrent that went wrong. Last June, a dummy missile launched by a submarine off the coast of Florida is reported to have veered off course. Theresa May insists the test was a success and she defended her decision not to tell MPs about it when they debated renewing Trident weeks later. Our political editor, Andy Bell, explains. It was a test like this one which went wrong. In June, the launch failed of an unarmed Trident missile fired from HMS Vengeance off the coast of Florida. But we still don't know exactly what happened. The Prime Minister today was out with her cabinet. Yesterday, she had avoided saying she knew about this. Today, she said she had been informed up to a point. I'm regularly briefed on national security issues. I was briefed on the successful certification of HMS Vengeance and her crew. We don't comment on the operational details for national security reasons. The failure happened just a few weeks before MPs voted to spend up to £41 billion to build new submarines for the Trident missiles. In the debate, Theresa May didn't mention the test failure, 
Today, Downing Street wouldn't say whether she knew it had gone wrong. A former Labour defence minister says she must have done. As a former defence minister, I know what uh, ministers get told at certain levels, and the idea of Prime Minister wouldn't have been told about this, I just find impossible to believe. So you're sure she would have been told something went wrong? Uh, she would have been given a full report, and knowing Theresa May, she reads everything. Test firings from British subs are relatively rare. There have been just five since 2000. The last one was 2012. They're rare because they're expensive. The current cost of a test, £17 million. Pounds. Diving now, diving now. But tests are normally made public and even potentially hostile countries are informed about them. Well, they're not secrets, uh, the fact that the test is taking place or roughly where it's supposed to go. So I think there's no national security reason why you can't announce in broad terms a test has been successful. The, the decision not to announce it uh, is a political one rather than a national security one. Thank you. Trident was already controversial enough. The suggestion that this was not allowed to surface has just added to that. Let's talk to Andy now at Westminster. Andy, has this row damaged the Prime Minister? Well, I think the problem is it's made her look a bit evasive. Yesterday she wouldn't answer this question directly. Today she said, yes, she did know about this test, but only up to a point, only that the crew and the submarine were certificated. That's the uh, military jargon for this. Uh, so that's a little bit awkward for her, but she does have a defence to fall back on, and that defence is national security. She has been relying on that. Basically, the line coming out is, do you really want the rest of the world to know when something goes wrong with your nuclear deterrent? Andy, thanks for that. And Theresa May was in the Midlands this morning to launch a new scheme to boost British industry after Brexit. She unveiled a new ten-point plan designed to improve growth in businesses across the country. Sinn Féin has announced Health Minister Michelle O'Neill will be its new leader. She'll replace Martin McGuinness, who announced his decision to retire from frontline politics last week. It comes ahead of Assembly elections in March. Northern Ireland police say an officer who was shot at a petrol station in North Belfast last night may have been saved by his body armour. The officer was shot three times in the arm by a gunman with a high-powered rifle. Donald Trump has been meeting business leaders as he begins his first full working week as US president. But in case you missed it, it's his inauguration and how many people were there to watch it that's been hitting the headlines. Images like this have been widely shared. Now, on the left is the crowd watching Barack Obama being sworn in eight years ago. On the right is the one for Mr Trump on Friday. At his press conference on Saturday, the White House's official spokesman launched an extraordinary tirade against journalists who reported that Mr Trump's crowd was smaller, saying he'd actually drawn the largest audience ever to witness an inauguration. So what's going on? Julian Drucker finds out. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. He was voted in, vowing to make America great again. So today, on his first full day as president, Donald Trump met US business leaders and he outlined how he plans to restore so much of the manufacturing the country has lost. We want to start making our products again. We don't want to bring them in, we want to make them here. And that doesn't mean we don't trade, because we do trade. But we want to make our products here. And he also threatened companies that move their manufacturing out of the US with a border tax. This may be officially day one of the Trump era, but so much has happened since Friday's inauguration. The weekend's democracy. protests in Washington, where women marched in their hundreds of thousands. A bizarre row over the size of the crowd at the inauguration, as the White House press secretary condemned the press. This was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration, period. These attempts to lessen the enthusiasm of the inauguration are shameful and wrong. As many accused Sean Spicer of lying, President Trump's top aide gave this unusually worded response. And giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. But the point remains... Wait a minute. Alternative that facts? There's... Alternative facts for the five facts he uttered. But aside from the wranglings over facts and falsehoods, America is undergoing a profound change. 
it's something brand new. It's almost like we have a president who's not quite with either party, and we're not used to that. We have a president who's doing exactly what he wants to do, but not everyone is clear, even within his own administration, exactly what that is. In the last hour, President Trump has signed executive orders, withdrawing from a trade deal negotiated by President Obama and cutting off funding for international groups that perform abortions. Minute by minute, Trump's America is taking shape. Okay. Julian Drucker, 5 News. Coming up on 5 News. The mum of three fighting cancer who urgently needs more cash to pay for her life-changing treatment. Had I have stayed on the palliative chemo that I was, you know, that, that was supposed to be the plan, I don't think we'd be here now having this conversation. I'm having to pay for it. And so far we're seeing positive results and it's working. And Milton Keynes at 50, the new town that's hitting middle age. We'll see you after the break. Hello and welcome back. You're watching 5 News. The inquests into the terror attack that killed 30 British tourists in Tunisia in 2015 has begun hearing details about those who died. Among them was mother of four Trudy Jones, a carer who'd been on holiday with friends, and John and Janet Stocker, who were described as a happy couple who were young at heart. Our chief correspondent, Tessa Chapman, was at the Royal Courts of Justice. 18 months after they lost the heart of their family, some of John and Janet Stocker's five children and ten grandchildren came to court to hear about how the well-travelled couple, who loved each other and loved life, came to die in Tunisia. This police animation shows where Safadin Rezgui shot his victims. The Stockers were on their sunbeds. In a statement read to the inquest, their friend, who'd been lying beside them, said, I saw the man standing over Janet and John. I saw the machine gun. I thought, I don't believe this is happening. As people fled, Anthony and his wife played dead until the gunman moved on. Then he said, I walked over to where Janet and John were. John was lying in the sand. Janet was slumped forward, half on and half off the sunbed. I don't know how many times she'd been shot. Trudy Jones died there too. A loving mother and grandmother, beautiful inside and out, the inquest heard. She'd been on holiday with her friend, who heard the commotion from the pool. I wanted to run towards the beach to check on Trudy, she said, but people were running towards me, shouting, go, go. I started to run towards the hotel with the crowds of people. Later, Carol had to identify her friend's body. She recognised the glittery nail varnish on her toes, an image that will stay with her like her memory of the gunman. The witness statements all described the attacker as a man dressed in black, holding a machine gun. They said he was calm, seemed familiar with the hotel and knew exactly where he wanted to go. One eyewitness said he looked a bit like a dummy, like he was doing a normal job as he sprayed bullets and people dropped to the floor. Another survivor described Rezgui firing a shot at close range, like an execution. There will be more distressing testimony in the days to come as all 30 of his British victims are remembered in turn. Tessa Chapman, 5 News. She was a mother of three, given months to live after a terminal cancer diagnosis. But Liz Shepherd would not accept she was going to die and leave her young family behind. So she paid for a relatively new treatment. It's called immunotherapy. It's not NHS approved to try to shrink the golf ball sized tumour on her neck. The technique uses the body's own immune system to fight off the cancer and so far it seems to be working. But now Liz is running out of money to pay for further treatment. Here's Peter Lane. Oh no! It's okay, it's okay. We can do it. Now more than ever, simple moments like this are precious for mum of three, Liz Shepherd. Given a terminal diagnosis for her rare form of stomach cancer, she took things into her own hands and raised money to fund a new treatment that the NHS wouldn't pay for. I can't just accept that I'm going to die and leave my children, so it's working and it's positive, so it's the best decision that I made. Had I have stayed on the palliative chemo that I was, you know, that, that was supposed to be the plan, 
I don't think we'd be here now having this conversation. This photo shows Liz before immunotherapy. The cancer was spreading and a tumour had formed in her neck. This was taken just two months later after she began the new treatment, which boosts the immune system to fight cancer. The NHS has started offering immunotherapy for some skin and lung cancers, but not for Liz. It's costing her £10,000 a month for private treatment. It's difficult to take in knowing that it's there and it's available and on the NHS, but just not for mine, but I'm having to pay for it. And so far we're seeing positive results and it's working. In her own words, Liz has begged for help and has managed to raise £120,000 so far with appeals like this. But the clinic treating her points out that it is early days still for our understanding of immunotherapy. We are trying very hard to make sure that we give immunotherapy to the right people at the right time. Um, we do caution this, we hear this a lot about this miracle cure. Immunotherapy is not for everyone. It doesn't work for everyone. It's just in those that it does work in, it works very well. For Liz right now, it is working, but the donations coming in will only fund a few more months of treatment. I'm grateful every morning that I wake up and open my eyes. I'm, I'm grateful that I'm here and I have to make the most of it. Liz hopes the next chapter of her own story will be a successful appeal for NHS funding and a broader approach to cancer treatment. Peter Lane, 5 News. Well, you can find out more about Liz's story and that pioneering treatment, immunotherapy. It's on our Facebook page. You just search for Channel 5 News. The actor Gordon Kay, best known for his role in the sitcom Allo Allo, has died at the age of 75. Oh, I, I just wish that this terrible war could be over very soon. Good, very good. But which side did you wish to win? Oh, yours, of course, Herr Kern. <laughs> he played the cafe owner, René Artois, in the show. It ran for more than 80 episodes from 1982 to 1992. His agent said he died at a care home this morning. Premier League footballer Ryan Mason is recovering in hospital after suffering a fractured skull. The 25-year-old who plays for Hull clashed heads with Chelsea's Gary Cahill during a game yesterday. He had surgery later that evening. He's said to be conscious and talking. And Britain's Joanna Conta is through to the quarter-finals of the Australian Open after beating Ekaterina Makarova. She'll now face Serena Williams, who's won the tournament six times. Finally, what connects Sir Cliff Richard on roller skates, the Open University and concrete cows? The answer is Milton Keynes, the new town that's celebrating its 50th birthday today. Created in 1967 as a way of easing a housing shortage in London, it's been equally admired and derided ever since. Minnie Stevenson paid a visit. Welcome to Milton Keynes, arguably most famous for its concrete cows and many roundabouts. Once a sleepy Buckinghamshire village transformed into a futuristic style town. And today it turns 50. Half a century since the government, with the help of modernist architects, built what they hailed to be a visionary model of urban living in Britain. You've never seen anywhere like it. Central Milton Keynes. There were even adverts inviting you not just to a place, but an experience. Central the critics, however, have not always been kind to Milton Keynes. In the past, calling it, and I quote, a soulless suburb, a non-place, even wait for it, a paradise of parking lots. But fans and residents beg to differ, saying, excuse me, look around you. This is clearly an urban Eden. A garden of opportunity. And if you don't believe me, take it from Tracy and Mark Willis. For four generations, their family-run florist has grown here. Being born and bred here, um, I've seen it change from just the small villages into the new town. Um, and people from the outside, they, they tend to see, oh, it's all sterile, there's no community spirit, um, but it's completely different. You've got the walks, the countryside, the parks, the lakes, you know, it's, all, it's just lovely. The world also has Milton Keynes to thank for this. Sir Cliff Richard roller skating through the town for his 1981 Wired for Sound video. Do you know it's also the home to the UK's first multiplex cinema? The town's Planet Ice Rink is where Torval and Dean trained ahead of their 1984 Olympic gold medal. Last year, the trials of Britain's first driverless car took place. You guessed it, 
in Milton Keynes. And its ratio of trees to humans is exceptionally high. The town has 22 million. That's around 100 trees per person. As the mayor plants another one on its birthday, we ask the future generation to tell us their favourite things about their 50-year-old town. I like all the places you can have fun with your family. That it's always growing. It's like, it's never, OK, we're going to break for a year, we're not going to do anything else. There's so much open space and greenland where you can go exploring and there's loads of wildlife. Today, the town, which was once hailed as the future, now looks back at half a century of history. Minnie Stevenson, Five News. Now, before we go, Matt has joined us to tell us what's coming up on Five News tonight. Hello. Hi, Sean. Thanks a lot. I'm going to be joined later on by a mum who's campaigning for all pregnant women to be tested for Strep B after her newborn son died of the infection. Also, I'm going to be chatting to two women who've become great friends after one of them received a priceless gift from the other one's late mother. Georgina Compton desperately needed a double lung transplant. And after she finally got those organs she needed, she made it her mission to thank the family of the woman whose death saved her life. Also, believe it or not, 1957 was Britain's happiest year. We'll be finding out why at 6.30. I can't remember it. <laughs> I'm not going to ask if you... I know you can't. How very dare you! <laughs> Neither can I, actually, Matt Barbette. Right, that's it for now. <laughs> Alex Deakin has the weather next. I will see you again tomorrow at 5. He's going to have a good talking to. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Bye for now.